Hello there, just before we kick off today's video, I do want to give a quick plug to a brand new channel that I have called Into the Shadows. If the name doesn't give it away, the channel is very much focused on the darker side of everything. Early episodes have covered things like how we fight the world's deadliest disease, how the Congo suffered the worst of colonialism, and how the Nazis escaped Europe to South America on the rat lines. So if you like to explore the darker side of history and science, please check out Into the Shadows. There is a link below. And now, today's video. In 1804, a British engineer by the name of Richard Trevithick unveiled a new form of transportation that would go on to completely revolutionize how both goods and people traveled. However, in the early stages at least, this was a slow, gradual process. When the first full-scale working steam locomotive was introduced, it failed to immediately take off, mainly because of its massive weight. But a spark had been lit. Ten years later, George Stevenson built the first of a series of locomotives that would eventually evolve into one of the defining symbols of the Industrial Revolution in Britain. From 1830, with the opening of the world's first recognized passenger railway between Liverpool and Manchester until around the 1870s, Victorian Britain saw one of the most staggering transportation expansions ever seen, as more than 13,500 miles, that's 21,700 kilometers of railway lines, were built all around the country. And considering Britain is relatively small, with the distance from John O'Groats to Land's End, from the top of Britain to the very bottom only being 1,407 kilometers or 870 74 miles, this was a staggering length of railway. This was Britain during its giddy heyday, when the vast empire drew absurd riches from around the world and its economy eclipsed anything ever seen before. The rampant industrial revolution completely changed Britain, and while it certainly began well before the introduction of the railways, it was the huge interconnected iron roads that spread to all parts of the country that left one of the longest lasting legacies. While the invention of steam locomotives completely changed the landscape of travel, there were still plenty of railways before this. They just functioned under a drastically reduced speed, often with the help of horses. The idea of laying tracks on the ground and then pulling a cart of some kind over it dates back to the early 16th century, and not in Britain, but rather in Austria. The Reichstag is a wooden funicular railway at the Hohen Salzburg Fortress in Austria, and is generally considered to be the oldest railway in the world. In Britain, the first wagon way, drawn by horses with wooden rails, was constructed near a mine in Kaldbeck in Cumbria in the 1560s, and it quickly caught on. Now, this sounds fairly basic, especially compared to what we have today, but this was absolutely groundbreaking, and it significantly sped up work in many industrial areas where large loads were frequently hauled. In the 1760s, wooden rails began to be replaced with iron, which improved their durability and load-bearing ability, while members of the public began riding on this new transportation system for the first time. The Lake Lock Railroad, an early narrow-gauge railway built near Wakefield in West Yorkshire in 1796, was principally used to haul coal, but did see the odd paying customers, making it one of the first railways to ever carry people. As I mentioned earlier, Richard Trevithick's groundbreaking steam locomotive that was first used on the tramway of the Penny Darren Ironworks near Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales in 1804 wasn't an immediate success. While the technology was certainly sound, the locomotive was far too heavy to be practical, and for a short period at least, the idea of railways was sort of just put to the side. But not for long. The first commercially successful locomotive was used on the small Middleton Railway, which serviced the Middleton Coilery in Leeds in 1812 and was known as the Salamanca. From here, things really began to pick up steam, pun certainly intended, and in 1813, the Puffing Billy locomotive was built by Christopher Blackett and William Headley for the Wylam Coilery Railway, and today it remains the oldest steam locomotive still in existence. Okay, so the name George Stevenson has become synonymous with early locomotives, and while he certainly wasn't the first to build such engines, he undoubtedly pushed this new technology to even greater heights. His first design was Blucher, a flanged wheel adhesion locomotive that could pull a train of 30 tons at a speed of 6.4 kilometers an hour, or 4 miles per hour, up a gradient of 1 in 450, which was completed in 1814 and used at the Killingworth Coilery. Next came his locomotion design, which was used on the Stockton and Darlington Railway, which was the first ever line 
patent to use a steam engine in 1826. And finally, the machine that really began to convince the masses the rocket. In October 1829, a competition known as the Rainhill Trials was held to settle the argument over how effective steam locomotives were and to prove whether or not they could be used for the new Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Five separate locomotives took part, one of which was Stevenson's rocket over a stretch of rail track that measured 1.6 kilometers or one mile. Alas, this was far from a complete glowing endorsement of the new technology as four of the five engines failed to finish. In fact, one was even disqualified from the start because it was less a locomotive and more a horse on a treadmill powering the wheels. The one locomotive that did make it all the way, maintaining a steady speed of 22 kilometers an hour or 13.8 miles an hour, was Stevenson's Rocket, which persuaded the owners of the new railway that this was the engine of the future. And boy, were they right. Now, it's fair to say that the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first anywhere in the world to connect two major cities, got off to a bit of a bumpy start, with a fatal accident occurring on the line on its very first day. A bad omen. William Huskisson, a member of Parliament for Liverpool, died after attempting to climb back aboard a carriage, but slipped and fell back into the path of the passing rocket locomotive which ran over his legs. For a technology that many still had enormous reservations over, this certainly was not an auspicious start. But this was still an extraordinary step forward. The railway that linked the two giants of northern England stretched for a total of 50 kilometers, that's 31 miles, and came with a catalog of firsts. This was the first railway to exclusively use steam locomotives, the first to have a signaling system, the first to even have a complete timetable, the first to carry post, and the first to be double-tracked along the entire route. The two-kilometer, 1.2-mile Wapping Tunnel beneath Liverpool was also the first to be bored under a city, while the entire railway line included a total of 64 bridges and viaducts. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which had cost £637,000, around £58 million today, was an enormous success, cutting travel time between the two cities to just two hours, with trains travelling around 26 kilometres an hour or 60 miles per hour. So this would be the blueprint that numerous other lines would follow in the coming years as thirst for railways began to grip the nation. In 1831, just a year after opening of the Liverpool and Manchester line, a short extension was added, which linked Warrington with Newton just outside Liverpool and to mining operations near Haydock. Just to give you an idea of how fast things were moving, just two years later, the 132-kilometer, 82-mile Grand Junction Railway opened, which linked Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Stafford, and crew, but also effectively succeeded the Warrington and Newton extension as it used the same route. The 32.2 km, 20 mile Leeds and Selby Railway was completed and opened in 1834 and included 43 bridges and around 16 level crossings, but the most significant engineering challenge was the construction of the 640 meter, 700 yard marsh line tunnel through Richmond Hill in Leeds. At the time, this was the world's longest railway tunnel, with most passenger accounts from the period describing the experience as a smoke filled hell in complete darkness. So this may have been a revolutionary way to travel, but there were still numerous kinks that needed to be ironed out. No one likes traveling through hell. In 1838, the first line to run in London opened and connected the capital with Birmingham over a 180-kilometer, 112-mile stretch. The construction process involved some 20,000 men and took five years to complete, with an estimated 710 million cubic square meters of earth moved in the process, reportedly enough to build a wall of 0.6 meters high by 0.6 meters across, that's one foot by one foot, around the equator three times. Okay, so all of these early lines have been constructed through private investments and were effectively owned by private companies whose investors reaped the rewards. It didn't take long for many to sit up and take notice of the steadily increasing profits that were dripping down from these new railway lines. With the British economy thundering forward, entrepreneurs began submitting applications for new railways left, right, and center, leading to a period known as railway mania. This principally occurred in 1836 and between 1845 and 1847, when Parliament authorized 8,000 miles, that's nearly 13,000 kilometers of lines, at a projected cost of 200 million pounds, that's around 24. percent eight billion pounds today. It's important to say that nowhere near that amount was actually built, with many companies going out of business or cancelling projects before they even began. In fact, only around 3,200 kilometers, that's 2,000 miles worth of railway line, was actually laid down during the second mania period. But over the next 10 years, a further 7,400 kilometers, that's 4,600 miles of track, was installed around Britain. In 1842, Queen Victoria made her first train journey between London
London and Slough, in which she reportedly told the driver to slow down because she was scared. Now, despite the odd splash of anxiety, the new form of travel now had royal approval. Up until this point, railway travel in Britain had remained a luxurious option, albeit one that often left you covered in soot and dirt. But this changed with the 1844 Railway Act, which forced all railway lines to provide at least one train per day at a reduced rate. By the 1850s, popularity had soared beyond all expectations, with 92 million journeys taken in England and Wales in 1854 alone on a rail system that now stretched over 9,600 kilometers, that's 600 miles. This had been an astonishing period, and in just over a decade, Britain's rail network had gone from a few scattered lines throughout the country to a vast interconnected system that linked cities, towns, and even small villages. The effect on Britain and its economy was dramatic. Prices of goods in cities fell as a result of the quick transportation routes, while there was a greater variety and choice than ever before. The coal mining, iron production, engineering, and construction industries also saw spectacular rises, but perhaps the biggest change was simply with the population. Considering that many had eyed the first railways with deep suspicion, British people took to this new form of transportation with incredible enthusiasm, which completely changed society. One point that often gets lost when discussing British railways was that it ushered in the use of standard time across the country. Before 1847, each town or village effectively operated on its own time, but this quickly changed as the need for careful timetabling emerged. By 1855, the vast majority of Britain was now operating under Greenwich Mean Time. During this period, an estimated 250,000 men worked on expanding the railway network around the country. These were known as navvies, and they would live in small shanty towns constructed beside these new tracks. This was backbreaking work, but was significantly better paid than jobs in factories. However, deaths often occurring during the excavation of tunnels were frequent, with the widow of a deceased navvy receiving around five pounds in compensation, which is roughly 700 pounds today. But things can only go so far, and like other speculation bubbles, railway mania eventually ended as investors began to realize that not every railway line could be profitable. The crash had been preceded by countless people, often middle-class families with a little money but not a huge amount, losing their entire savings through investments in failed lines. The 1860s and 1870s saw brief flickers of further booms, but nothing could compare to the dramatic days of the 1840s and 1850s when most of Britain was connected. The British government had been gradually increasing its oversight of the railway lines through a series of parliamentary acts, but these had mainly focused on safety to begin with. Slowly, calls for the nationalization of the entire railway network grew, but this wouldn't happen until World War I. By the late 1870s, most railway companies were struggling to turn significant profits because the system had become so saturated and the golden age of Victorian Britain's railways was drawing to a close. Despite the dramatic slowdown, the foundations had been set for a system that had completely changed Britain. As the end of the century drew to a close, the country was crisscrossed by an incredibly intricate system that reached deep into the most rural of areas. The Industrial Revolution may have kick-started this period of great change, but it was the railway network that swept it along. By the end of the 1870s, an astonishing 21,700 kilometers, that's 13,500 miles, had been laid throughout Britain in just over 40 years, which is more than the distance between London and Auckland in New Zealand, at a cost of three billion pounds, somewhere in the region of 400 billion pounds today. But the physical lines were only part of the story, and this period saw enormous leaps forward in terms of engineering, with tunnels, viaducts, and bridges added along the way where needed. It was a time when everything seemed possible, and the only limits were in the imagination. It had been a staggering four decades that forever changed Britain during one of the most intensive engineering periods that the world has ever known. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.